Council Member Castellano. Here. Council Member Messner. Here. Council Member Arroyo. Here. Council Member Allison. Here. Council Member Brigale. Here. All right. Um, next, I would like to invite you to join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much. Um, and now, um, Mr. City Attorney Black, do we have a report out from closed session? We do, Mayor. Uh, this is the report. On motion of Council Member Arroyo, seconded by Council Member Messner, uh, to accept the REMIF negotiated settlement in the case of Fitzhugh versus City of Eureka, the motion was carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, next, we are going to move on to. Yes, ma'am. Did, my... Did I forget something? Oh. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to move on to um, mayor's announcements. We have a few proclamations tonight. So, first, I would like to invite Councilmember Messner to talk about law enforcement records and professional and professional staff day. There we go. Unmuted. Thank you. Um, so in recognition of law enforcement records and professional staff day, November 6, 2020, whereas law enforcement agencies throughout the state depend upon law enforcement records and professional staff personnel to provide them with these vital services. And whereas information is the lifeblood of any organization and accurate law enforcement records must be created, collected, processed, maintained, disseminated, and disposed of in accordance with local state and federal laws. And whereas citizens have an expectation law enforcement records are maintained with accuracy and integrity, overseen by staff dedicated to continual professional development and the highest standard of operational efficiency. And whereas enforcement records and professional staff personnel are crucial to helping law enforcement agencies identify, pursue, capture, and process suspected law violators. And whereas those professionals continually use their expertise and experience to assist in serving the public, maintaining criminal statistics and assisting patrol and investigators um, track felons and improve apprehension strategies. And whereas it is important to recognize California's law enforcement records and support personnel for their valuable contributions to our law enforcement system. And whereas the Eureka Police Department records section is responsible for the integrity of law enforcement records for prosecutors, allied agencies and citizens tracking missing and wanted persons, accounting for recovered stolen vehicles, firearms and properties, live scan and fingerprint services, call taking, parking enforcement responsibilities, creation and verification of statistical reports for the Department of Justice and Federal Bureau of Investigations, and a host of behind the scenes duties in support of the department and city goals. Now, therefore, I, Heidi Messner, on behalf of the mayor and Eureka City Council, do hereby recognize and express support for the Eureka Police Department Records Section and professional staff personnel for their invaluable service to the department and the city and proclaim November 6, 2020 as Law Enforcement Records and Professional Staff Day in Eureka, California. Thank you all. That is a long list. <laughs> you guys <did> a great <laughs> job. <laughs> Thank you. And Chief, I see you're um, on the line. Did you have anything to follow that up with? Yes, and, and second, I'll introduce you briefly to Amanda O'Neill. I believe she's on and she is our records manager. You know, I have to say that um, it's a challenging job for her and her staff and has been for as long as I've been with the Eureka Police Department. But the last several years, um, the requirements of them have immensely changed with changes to the law and everything from uh, how crime statistics are now being tracked from 
uh, you know, the FBI, the DOJ to um, a bunch of other things that are being piled on every year. And it's amazing what they've been able to do. I have heard repeatedly from, you know, our allied agencies that they look to our records uh, department as a local leader and example to strive for. And uh, a large part of that is just due to their work ethic and the job that they do every day. So we're extremely appreciative. Thank you for recognizing them today. And briefly, if Amanda would like to say something. Thanks, Chief. I just wanna thank everyone for your support. I have a great team. I'm very blessed to have some dedicated hard workers. Um, 2020 certainly been unique. It's presented challenges none of us anticipated and their adaptability every single day from the second COVID started through to whatever the next couple of months hold. Um, I know we'll get through it and really looking forward to some significant changes the chief was mentioning in 2021. So thank you, council. Thank you, mayor. Thank you, chief, for your support. And thank you for this evening. Thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. All right. So now we're going to move on to the next proclamation. This one will be read by Council Member Burgell for National American Indian Heritage Month. Oh, you're off. You are mute. Here I am. City of Eureka Proclamation in recognition of National American Indian Heritage Month, November 2020. Whereas the history and culture of our great nation have been significantly influenced by American Indians and indigenous peoples, and whereas the contributions of American Indians have enhanced the freedom, prosperity, and greatness of America today, and whereas the time has come to stop suppressing the memories of crimes constituted against American Indians by the seizing and occupying of their land. And whereas historic atrocities committed against the tribes living in Humboldt County are recently coming to light. And whereas American Indian customs and traditions which were once suppressed are now respected and celebrated as part of rich legacy throughout the United States. And whereas Eureka was the first municipality in the United States to unconditionally return land to its original owners. And whereas Native American Awareness Week began in 1976, was expanded by Congress and approved by President George Bush in August 1990, designating the month of November as National American Indian Heritage Month. And whereas in honor of National American Indian Heritage Month, community celebrations, as well as cultural, artistic, educational, and historical activities have been planned throughout the nation. Now, therefore, we, the City of Eureka, do hereby proclaim November 2020 as Amer National American Indian Heritage Month in the city and urge all of our citizens to observe this month with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. Thank you. Yay. Do we have anybody here to receive this um, proclamation? Thank you. It looks like Virginia Howard Mullen. Great. Thank you, Mayor and Council. My name is Virginia Howard Mullen, and I am the regent of the Eel River Valley uh, DAR. The National DAR Indian Committee is dedicated to the continuing education of the history and culture of the American Indian community, as well as the support of the educational and cultural pursuits of its citizens. We thank you for recognizing them during the month of November. Thank you. And thank you for coming to receive this. You bet, we appreciate your time. So we have a third proclamation and this one is for National Nurse Practitioner Week. And that week is, oh, I guess it'll be right in the comments. <laughs> Whereas nurse practitioners, NPs, serve as trusted healthcare providers for patients in our state. And as, whereas this year, 2020, we celebrate the International Year of the Nurse and the Midwife, 
And whereas NPs are working tirelessly to diagnose and treat patients with COVID-19 and to combat community spread nationwide while grieving NP colleagues who have lost their lives during the pandemic. And whereas NPs work to expand access to care in, under, in underserved communities, end health disparities and combat systemic racism in healthcare. And whereas NPs provide high quality primary acute and specialty care services while focusing on health promotion, disease and prevention, health education and counseling, guiding patients to make smarter health and lifestyle choices every day. And whereas NPs are highly skilled practitioners with advanced education and clinical training, building upon their initial registered nurse preparation. And whereas the confidence that patients have in NP delivered healthcare is evidenced by more than 1 billion visits made annually to NPs across the country. And whereas more than five decades of research demonstrates the high quality of care provided by MPs, and whereas there are more than 290,000 licensed NPs in the United States and over 20,000 in California, where recent passage of AB 890 will expand access to NP care in California. And whereas better utilization of NPs through modernized state laws and improved policies creates better health through a more accessible, efficient, cost-effective, and higher quality healthcare system. And whereas 22 states, the District of Columbia, Guam, and Northern Mariana Islands have implemented full practice authority for NPs, granting patients full and direct access to the outstanding care offered by these healthcare providers. And whereas leading governmental and policy entities, including the National Academy of Medicine, National Council of State Boards of Nursing, National Governors Association and Federal Trade Commission have taken notice of the benefits of NP full practice authority and have endorsed such a regulatory model. And whereas the Eureka City Council is proud to recognize and honor the service of NPs in our state. Now, therefore, I, Mayor Susan Seaman, on behalf of the Eureka City Council, do hereby declare November 4th, 8th through 14th, 2020, as National Nurse Practitioner Week in recognition of the countless contributions NPs have made over the past half century and will continue to make on behalf of the health and well-being of citizens in our state. Yay! Is there anybody here to accept this uh, proclamation? Um, Mayor Seaman, uh, no, the, the uh, requester did not um, appear tonight, so. Okay, well, I will just um, say I love my MP and very, very grateful that we have her, especially in a community like ours where we need more medical care and that allows it, allows us to have it. So, yay. Hey, for a quick comment. Council Member Arroyo. Um, I just wanted to um, express my appreciation to um, Assembly Member Jim Wood for bringing for, forward AB 290, uh, 890, excuse me. Um, it was, something that I think is a big deal for communities like ours where so many patients are seen by NPs and um, in the, um, it removes the requirement that there be a supervising physician. Um, and so really NPs have nearly all of the same abilities as um, MDs in our community. And so I, I know from friends who are NPs in the community though, that sometimes there's a perception that they don't have those, um, that training and that licensure. Um, and so, you know, I think it's helpful to do things like this um, and to let folks in the community know that NPs can really um, be seeing them as an MD would without an MD supervision. So um, to ensure that people have full trust in their practitioners. Very nice. Anybody else want to say something? All right. Um, so then I am going to move on to um, just kind of the comment portion of my mayor's report. And um, something came up today. I mean, we all have our minds on the election, I'm sure. Um, and last year, when I was completing the work on our children and families plan, we, um, I went and watched the Tom Hanks movie about Mr. Rogers. This wasn't the one I watched with you, Natalie, where I cried and cried, but 
so I didn't like Mr. Rogers a lot. In it, there was a restaurant scene where the camera panned across the room where the staff and crew and friends from Mr. Rogers' neighborhood were sitting. People wouldn't necessarily notice that, but there were people that I worked with during my time at Key TV. So after the movie, I reached out to David Newell, who played Mr. McFeely, um, to tell him about how my work at Mr. Rogers' neighborhood inspired my work with the city and the Children and Families Plan. So today, a year later, I got a response from him. And it seemed like such good timing to come on a day that's so fraught with anxiety and so many people are so stressed out. And um, Mr. Rogers' messages about kindness, they weren't just placations. They, um, he was able to make big, impactful change with a quiet, uncondescending consistency that was just wrapped in kindness. And he talked about hard things. Um, he talked about things like divorce and death and Vietnam War and 9-11. And in a world where everyone seems to be yelling, he showed that quiet strength could be resounding. And so David's letter today um, made today lighter for me. And I thought we could all use a reminder about the power of kindness and that no matter what happens tonight or tomorrow or the next day or later on this week, um, we can build our own fortitude by remembering those people who provide us strength that by supporting us for who we are. And we could also be that person for others. So today I am gonna pull a card from the Mr. Rogers playbook. And I'm gonna ask you all to take a few minutes, a few seconds to remember who gives you strength and who inspires you. So I am gonna ask Assistant City Manager Powell to put 30 seconds on the clock where we'll just be quiet and we'll remember those people um, who do that, who provide us strength and who inspire us. So would you mind doing that Assistant City Manager Pell? Thank you. I know it's a long time to sit quiet with our own thoughts. Um, but no matter what happens with this election, um, the gift that those people that you just thought about gave us are still going to be there to help us endure, disapprove, or win gracefully over the next week. So I want to close by thanking those folks out there who are working today in the polls. Um, it's a ton of work for them. And I want to help those who have been out there voting, practicing their civic duty, those who helped get out the vote, and those, um, those few people who actually stood up and ran for office. So it's a hard, uh, it's going to be a, a fraught few days, but we can all get through this um, with a little kindness. That was it. And with that, I'm gonna move into the regular meeting. And we are gonna to start today with um, some presentations. We're gonna have our first presentation is the Eureka Housing Authority update. And I'm going to invite uh, Executive Director of the Housing Authority, Cheryl Churchill to speak. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Mayor Salmon. Hi there. Thank you all for giving me a few minutes to give a very brief update um, overview of public housing in Eureka, where we're at, where we're headed, and um, as I'll be asking for community input in the coming months. A lot of folks aren't too familiar with our housing authorities or may not even know we exist, yet we're just one block from the Eureka Mall, and we serve about 1,200 families. The Eureka and Humboldt Housing Authorities are two distinct housing authorities that exist under one roof to supply affordable housing. We are the County of Humboldt Housing Authority, which operates the Housing Choice Voucher Program, also known as Section 8, currently supporting about 900 families throughout Humboldt County via partnerships with private landlords, for whom we are very thankful. And we are the City of Eureka Housing Authority, which owns and manages 269 rental units, including senior and family housing, 
and our largest rental program, which is traditional public housing. This is the program I want to talk about tonight. Currently, our public housing program is providing homes for 191 families, or almost 2% of the households in Eureka. 108 of these are single parent homes navigating the challenges of working and raising their children. 69 of these heads of households are disabled and dealing with issues many of us may never imagine. And 51 of these households, over 25%, were homeless at admission, and a majority of those tenants have now been housed for a year or longer. These tenants work in our community, they volunteer and provide community service, their children attend our schools, and altogether they result in over $6 million in annual income that goes back into our community. Due to years of underfunding public housing, HUD is encouraging PHAs with public housing units to go through a process they call repositioning. HUD's goal was to reposition more than 10% of the U.S. public housing stock by the end of 2020, largely by transitioning from a traditional public housing model to tenant-based or project-based voucher assistance using the Section 8 program. HUD's intent is to create more flexible financing opportunities for housing authorities and to put affordable housing properties on a path to long-term financial stability. Options for repositioning include HUD's RAD program, which creates public-private partnerships to rehab and to manage affordable housing with project-based vouchers. There's also voluntary conversion of public housing to voucher-based assistance. And there's disposal and demolition of public housing, which entails releasing housing authorities from their declarations of trust with HUD, paving the way to bring in developers and investors to rebuild. When looking at HUD's options, disposition and demolition for Eureka's oldest properties built in the 1950s and 1960s, as well as voluntary conversion to voucher support for our newer properties, are strong options we're exploring for our 198 public housing units in Eureka. Currently, we're at the very early stages of working toward a project that classifies as repositioning under HUD's various flexible strategies. Ideally, the outcome of repositioning would be to increase the number of families we serve by adding more affordable housing units in Eureka. We intend to issue an RFQ in the coming months to look for qualified developers interested in working on a multi-phase project, and then to issue an RFP from a subset of these in 2021. To make this project a reality, we'll be leaning on local landlords with excess housing capacity to provide voucher supported temporary rehousing for tenants. And as things get underway, the Housing Authority will hold several meetings, either by Zoom, conference call, in person, depending on the pandemic status, to receive input from our tenants and the community regarding design requests and requirements. The takeaway tonight I want for you all is this. The Housing Authority's goal is to, at a minimum, improve our affordable housing stock. But further, we have an opportunity here not to just not just to better our existing housing, but to create new improved housing that helps meet the needs of our community, including adding more affordable housing. Please be thinking about what you consider our greatest local needs so you'll be ready to share your thoughts and give input when we begin having public meetings. This will be an extensive process and it's important to me that we hear from our tenants and our community and our local government to work toward our shared goals. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Council member Bergel and then, and then Castellano and then Arroyo. Oh, you're on mute. There you go. So I was just curious, does what you're talking about this evening have to do with the um, the redoing or the refurbishing of the projects near the Eureka Mall, or is this something that's completely different? So our biggest um, property is the units across from the Eureka Mall. We mm -hmm. have um, just over 100 units here. And so when I talk about a multi-phase project, we um, we look at doing something here as one phase. And then we also have scattered sites around Eureka. Um, and the units built here were um, first occupied around 1952. So it's post-war housing. It is our oldest housing. 
Um, and then we have another 60 units from the 1960s and then 40 units from the 70s and 80s. So that's kind of the split between the older 50s, 60s and the newer 70s, 80s. Um, so yes, we will be looking into what can we do to um, possibly rebuild our oldest housing and to rehab the newer housing. Um, but uh, our board is all in agreement that uh, by no means do we want to lose any units. We have a lot of space here and what we'd like to do is be able to add more. So that's what we'll be looking into. I was, I was um, remembering a plan that came forward. I think it was in 2014 when we were new on council um, where they had talked about doing phasing where they would um, move some of the tenants and then rebuild and then move some of the tenants and rebuild. Is that something that's still going forward? I guess that's more direct. <laughs> right, so I think that um, there was a little momentum for that. And then we had the change of administration and it brought in kind of a period of uncertainty as to what HUD funding would look like um, and what um, options we would have. Um, and I would say in Eureka, we haven't been forerunners of anything in the public housing realm. And so now here we are, you know, five years later where HUD has pushed for housing authorities to do RAD. And we've seen various outcomes of that. Um, and other housing authorities have led the way in this demo dispo process and creating public private partnerships. And um, I think we have better examples to see now where it's been successful and the change in administration, um, I don't know if it, it really would have made as big of a difference, but it was a conservative step to just kind of back off from that and wait and see how things go. Um, but, you know, here we are another five, eight years later, and um, it's, it's time to address the backlog of repairs and updates that need to happen. I mean, across the country, but um, certainly here and, um, so yeah, that's where we're at. We're exploring what we can do. Council member Castellano. Um, firstly, thank you for your work. I've met a lot of people who benefit from the HUD housing in Eureka. Um, I was just curious if you could say a little bit more about the phasing approach. You know, I think we're all, uh, you know, want to make sure that people aren't going to be in a precarious position, you know, as their housing is uh, changed or developed or improved. Right, and that's obviously um, one of our most important things is just what happens to our tenants while we're looking at, you know, demolishing and rebuilding. And so, um, you know, this site here across from Winco, uh, back in the 50s, it was really important to have yards and have housing spread out and for everybody to have, you know, a certain amount of space. It's a very traditional way of building. Um, and so what we have here is a lot of space um, that's um, not efficiently used. And so when we talk about phasing a rebuild, um, we have a lot of space to work with to add more units. That's also where I say that partnering with local landlords um, to temporary rehouse our current tenants is also going to be a top priority. Um, basically, how that works is tenants get moved um, and they take a Section 8 voucher, essentially, to, um, to a local landlord. And that operates basically as our Section 8 program does. And then when units are rebuilt, they have the uh, first priority to come back or they can keep a Section 8 voucher. So, um, you know, like I said, we wouldn't be the first to do this process. Um, HUD has a lot of requirements to make sure that tenants are, are not put out on the street and that they get the first cho choice to come back or if they're happy with, you know, where they end up during that temporary period to keep their voucher and that opens a spot uh, for somebody else to come in. Um, but yeah. Phasing is basically a way that we don't have to rehouse 200 families at once um, because you know it's it's hard enough right now. I think we have about uh, 40 people um, looking 
uh, right now on our Section 8 program for housing. And um, I'd like to say the success rate with that would be more than 50%, um, but that's not historically what we've seen. So you can imagine rehousing all 200, 200 of our public housing tenants at once would be impossible. Um, but it is built into the process that we are required to find them temporary housing with voucher support. Did that answer your question? Okay, thank you. Councilmember Royo. Thank you for the um, great update and um, really appreciate all your work. I wanted to ask about the um, change a couple of years back where um, folks in our community voted to increase the cap on the number of um, affordable units in Eureka. Um, could you talk about the implications of that and what we might see in the future as a result of that? So like I mentioned, we have a good amount of space here to work with. Um, so there's that because I think we all know there's not a lot of available space in Eureka. Um, and we also acknowledge that there isn't enough senior housing here there aren't enough one bedroom units here for people um, in affordable housing. And so, um, and this is where I come back to, we ideally would like to add more units. Um, we have the space to do it, you know? And so when I talk about being at the beginning stages of repositioning, we're going to look at um, what developers are out there that we can work with, um, what financing strategies we have, um, and really what we can do to add housing units in Eureka. Uh, you know, looking at the housing element are uh, the number that we say we can build in a, in, you know, a certain number of years and the need, they don't match. You know, the number that we can build doesn't even keep up with the need. So, um, you know, if we could even increase um, our affordable housing, you know, that this agency provides by 10%, um, that would be a gain. You know, it, if the finances are there, it could be more, um, no promises, but you know, we, I feel like we have some space to work with and we're just gonna be looking for people's input um, to see what, what the community supports, um, you know, what the city supports and what we can do. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question. Um, is there interest um, either from the housing authority or in the community in um, efficiency style apartments, um, spaces that are pretty compact? Yeah, I definitely think that's something that we would look at. Um, as I mentioned, there aren't enough um, one bedroom units and senior units. Uh, we're supporting half of the units at um, Danco's project, Bayview Heights on 4th Street. And those are great units, you know, they're, they're built mostly for single person households. And um, I don't know if any of you have been in there, but they're really nice. I mean, there's, there's absolutely no, um, no reason we wouldn't look at doing more of those units. Um, you know, financially, you can add a lot more of those than you can three and four bedroom units. So um, definitely a possibility. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask, do you, when you plan your housing, which is the primary and maybe sole purpose is for housing, do you ever, do you figure out supportive services in there like childcare? Would you ever like build a childcare facility in, in the unit? It's a good question. Um, somebody mentioned the, um, the idea a number of years back about um, rebuilding. And at that point, there was a vision that included retail space, you know, potential daycare, community space. Um, and I wasn't, you know, in the process at that point. Um, and so at this point, it, it is kind of what can we, uh, what can we do financially? Um, what is the community requesting? And is the support there to do that? Uh, you know, you look at uh, what Danco is building in Samoa right now, 
and their plans there are, you know, almost to, for it to be its own self-contained community with um, daycare and community center and medical and all that. And it's great. Um, it, again, it, it comes down to what is financially feasible, you know, what can the project support? So it's definitely something that we would look at. Okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much for coming in and I hope to hear from you more often um, because it's a, such an important part of what's going on in our community. And uh, this is the first time we got, got to visit with you since I've been here. So I am looking forward to hearing from you more. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to see some familiar faces here. Um, and so we'll move on to the next presentation, which is the Eureka or the holiday campaign report. And that's going to be our economic development coordinator, Christine Tyson. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having me here tonight. I will be introducing the city of Eureka's holiday campaign efforts this year. Uh, this year, the city of Eureka wanted to make a huge effort towards supporting local businesses, shopping local, and highlighting what Eureka has to offer during the seasonal time of year. This year, more than ever, with COVID-19, our businesses and local economy need us. We are impressed by our local businesses and how creative and strong they have been through this year of uncertainty. Many of those businesses struggled through the tourism season and what is normally their most successful time of year. We are committed to supporting them during this holiday season and making our best effort towards success during these hard times. The city of Eureka has been involved with COVID Economic Resilience Consortium, also known as CERC Work Group, since the beginning of the pandemic in March, the beginning of the year. The work group involves a countywide collaboration of economic development agencies and organizations. The holiday campaign is a subcommittee of this work group and included cities, chambers, business improvement districts, Humboldt Maid, and Main Street programs throughout the Humboldt County region. Tonight, we will introduce the Eureka specific portion of this campaign and how everyone can get involved. What is this campaign all about? The campaign objective is to create a strong unified voice, promoting the importance of shopping locally during the COVID-19 crisis and through the 2020 holiday season. We are committed to supporting our local businesses this holiday season and encourage, to encourage all to stand by and support our community. This campaign is social media and online based. We will be making a large online presence through the season starting November 1st and through the new year. We here in Eureka will be highlighting different things that you can do with your family that fall under the public health recommendations that are safe, but all while enjoying the season. This year with COVID-19, we are all a little closer to home for the holidays. Let's celebrate that home by shopping locally and supporting our local businesses and the families that run them. This year, let's really embrace home and celebrating all that Eureka has to offer. We can share our family traditions with each other and take good care of our community. Business participation, how can businesses get involved? The first thing that they can do is record a short 30 to 60 60 second video and help spread the shop local love. What would that be in that video? Sharing their uh, reasoning for shopping local and why it's important, telling us about their favorite Eureka holiday tradition, maybe their founding story, or sharing something new about their business. Does your business actively give back to the community because we're super interested in hear bit, hearing about it? And of course, ending with Choose Humble and Shop Eureka. If businesses are interested in participating by doing a PSA, I, along with Emily Kirsch from Eddie Alexander, are more than willing to come record your video. If you would like to do your own, you can always send it to me directly through email. Another way businesses can get involved is by representing the Shop Local campaign by dis displaying our Shop Local window decals that will be distributed later this season. And last but not least, use those hashtags in any and all of your seasonal posts. Choose Humble and Shop Eureka. Citizen participation. How can citizens get involved? Show your businesses some love by following, sharing, and liking the campaign materials. Are you out and about shopping this holiday season? Post, share, and tag Choose Humble at Shop Eureka. If you're online shopping this holiday season, be sure to check out our local businesses. Lots of them have online presence and store to shop 
stores to shop right from your very own home. Next, I'm going to show you some of our local storytelling videos that are, represent our local business owners um, who are joining us in this campaign this holiday season. Hi, I'm Lynn Jones from Just My Type Letterpress Bakery. We've been in Old Town Eureka for four years now, and in June, we moved around the corner to the front of the Carson Block building at Third and I print greeting cards, fine art block prints, and the letterpress portion of the Dick Taylor craft chocolate packaging right here in the store. This community means so much to all of us, and we want everyone to thrive. Each year, I give a portion of my art sales back to local nonprofits. My team and I have curated the shop of cards, gifts, art, and supplies that suits the needs of our local community as well as visitors to our area. We have one small request. Before you buy an item from an online mega site, make a phone call or two and see if you can find that item locally. You might be surprised that you can find it locally, get it faster, and not have to worry about the expense and environmental impact of shipping. Not only do we encourage you to shop locally, we practice what we preach. We support local makers by buying their work to sell in our store. Currently, we have cards and gift items from more than 20 of your favorite local artists. So, choose humble, shop Eureka. Hi, I'm Dustin Taylor. I'm one of the founders of the Taylor Craft Chocolate. It's located down here on 4th Street in Eureka. I remember earlier, you know, I would shop online and not really think locally until I started owning my own business and all of a sudden reality. How important local is. It's so big. There's so many livelihoods. Just here at Dick Taylor, we have 15 people that work here and really rely on you coming in and supporting us. And we love to keep that dollar local as well. So choose Humboldt and shop Eureka. That concludes my presentation tonight, and I hope Council will support us, will support and help us promote this campaign. And we also invite all of Eureka to join us in supporting our local businesses this holiday season. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm here like if you guys have any questions. Looks like we have a question from Council Member Brigell. Thanks for that great presentation. I love the videos. So I'm curious about the online presence. So is there going to be a link or something where you can find like a grouping of businesses or is it just you have to know the business's name to go there? Um, no, um, we're working right now on creating a platform on our own uh, city website. So we'll be sharing that in the future here soon. Um, we'll have a platform with all the information that people can easily access, but we will be um, spreading a lot of information through social media, um, our newsletter, um, and also just our website in general throughout the season. Thank you. It's exciting. Anybody else have any questions? Or comments? Or comments. Or comments. <laughs> just um, thank you. And uh, so if everyone who's hearing this just puts shop local, hashtag shop local and puts pictures um, up and anything that we can do, that's what you're asking, right? For us to do over the um, next- <laughs> yes, but I will say it's Shop Eureka. Oh, Shop Eureka, sorry. <laughs> shop Eureka, hashtag Shop Eureka. <laughs> yes. I love that this campaign is uh, countywide too, and that each community is picking their own city to highlight. Um, that'll bring a nice continuity. What we talk about a lot is, you know, uh, rising tide lifts all boats. So we want all of our local communities to do better. And uh, we want Eureka to do really well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's been really fun to work with um, other organizations. And it's been a really good experience in the last month or so to kind of collaborate this campaign. And of course, we here at the City of Eureka have been working on our own personal campaign for the holidays as well to support our businesses here in Eureka. So we're really excited about it. Right on. Well, thank you so much. And we will keep Thanks our eyes having. open. And and we'll hashtag away. Thank you. I, I hashtag the dine-in thing for the first time, which is probably my first hashtag ever. So it's baby Go steps. <laughs> Thank you. All right. 
Uh, it's time to move on to the public comment period. And this is the time when the public gets to speak on issues not on the agenda. And I do believe we have a caller today. So Assistant City Manager Powell. Oh, you're muted. Yes, Mayor, I have Latanya Jacobs on the phone and I will ask her to begin speaking. All right, thank you. Ms. Jacobs, uh, you'll have three minutes and you can begin now. Hi, my name is Latanya Jacobs. I live in Eureka, California. I was looking for a house to rent to own or a home, house to rent uh, or to purchase. And one of the obstacles I was uh, facing, this is regarding housing. My, my issue is, um, or my comment is related to housing. Some of the issues I've had when I was facing was uh, currently looking for housing, being asked to pay for listings of housing, houses that are available in the city of Eureka. Need information about realty companies or property managers. I wanna make sure that what I'm dealing with are yeah, reputable companies and not something, some fly by night places. Um, Cause if they're asking me to pay for listings, that sounds kind of weird or shady. Um, online viewing of property is sometimes limited. If they're saying that they don't want you to, um, they want to make sure that they have serious buyers or renters. So list the uh, images or photos that they have of the property is very limited. So you can't help but need to go and view the property. And that's an issue. Uh, must be on the bus route, the, the housing must be on the bus route near grocery stores and close to the business district in Eureka and must be reasonably priced. Um, I'm not the one who's um, earning a lot of money and I want to make sure that I'm getting a decent place that doesn't have rodents and a place that um, has um, doesn't need to have work stuff on it. Working appliances, work washers, uh, dryer, refrigerator, stove range, um, and uh, those are just some of the obstacles or things that I'm concerned with or would be hoping to find uh, decent housing in the city of Eureka. That's my comment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Did we have any other public comment today? No, Mayor, we did not have any other requests. All right, thank you very much. So we will move on to the consent calendar. Does anybody want to pull anything from the consent calendar or do I have a motion to approve it? Councilmember Messner. I'll make the motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. Council second. Oh, Member Arroyo said it. <laughs> Can we do a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Castellano? Aye. Councilmember Mesner? Aye. Councilmember Arroyo? Aye. Councilmember Allison? Yes. Councilmember Burgell? Aye. Unanimous yes vote. Motion carries. Excellent. So now we're going to move on to um, ordinances and resolutions. Item C1 is bill number 987 CS chapter 150 for electric vehicle charging stations. And this is going to be um, a, second, a second presentation. And I forgot to ask who was doing it. I can't remember who did it last time. Is that? Lisa. Lisa. Yes. Lisa. Okay, there you are. Yes. Thank Good you. Thank you, Mayor Council. I'm gonna share my screen with you. Can you see the screen? You can. Okay. So this evening we have bill number 987-CS, a municipal code amendment for expedite, expediting permit processing for electric vehicle charging stations. And um, the bill is for adoption today. Um, we brought it forward at the last council meeting, and today we're here for adoption. Um, 
So the recommendation is uh, waive reading, read by title only, and adopt bill number 987-CS, an ordinance of the City of Eureka, amending Eureka Municipal Code, Title 15, Chapter 150, to add Section 150.400, setting forth procedures for expediting permit processing for electric vehicle charging stations. All right. Do we have any questions for Senior Planner Savage? It looks like we're all good there. Do we have any public comment on this item? No, Mayor, we have not had any requests. All right. So I will bring it back for comments uh, and or a motion. Well, Council Member Bergal. Well, I would like to Wave, move, wave reading, read by title only, and adopt bill number 987-CS, an ordinance of the City of Eureka amending Eureka Municipal Code Title 10, Chapter 150 to add Section 150.400, setting forth procedures for expediting permit processing for electric vehicle charging stations. I'll, I'll second. second. Is that Council Member Messner that seconded? Okay, can we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Castellano? Aye. Councilmember Mesner? Aye. Councilmember Arroyo? Aye. Councilmember Allison? Yes. Councilmember Bergel? Aye. Unanimous yes vote. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And we will now move on to item C2. Bill number 988. CS chapter 150 for efficiency dwelling units. And I believe this one is senior planner um, Castellano. Yep. Yay. You got it. Okay, let me share my screen. I'm gonna try to keep this as brief as possible. Okay, so we were here at your last meeting as well uh, to introduce this bill for an, an ordinance to amend our building code. Uh, to decrease the minimum size of efficiency dwelling units from 220 square feet to 150 square feet and allow partial kitchens and bathroom facilities, which is allowed by California Health and Safety Code section 17958.1. And this was in order to for the city to support the creation of housing through motel conversions, as well as the development of accessory dwelling units. So um, um, the recommendation is on the board uh, to waive the reading and adopt the bill. I'm right. here for questions. Do we have any questions today? Looks good. And now I'll ask, do we have any comments from the public on this item? No, Mayor, no comments today. All right, I will bring it back for comments in Council Member Arroyo. I move that we waive for reading, read by title only, and adopt bill number 988-TAC-CS, an ordinance of the City of Eureka, amending Eureka Municipal Code Title 15, Chapter 150, Sections 150.016 and 150.017 pertaining to efficiency dwelling units. I'll second. Very nice. We have a motion and a second in discussion. I forgot to ask about discussion last time. All right, then we can have a roll call vote. Councilmember Castellano? Aye. Councilmember Mesner? Aye. Councilmember Arroyo? Aye. Councilmember Allison? Yes. Councilmember Bergel? Aye. Unanimous yes vote, motion carries. All right, so we will now move on to the next item, item C3, bill number 986 CS, Citizens Advisory Board to the Chief of Police. That would be you, Chief Watson. <laughs> right. well, good evening, Mayor, members of the council. Uh, as you recall, during the last council meeting, um, we introduced bill number 986 CS, which was an ordinance for the city of Eureka that added a formal citizens advisory board to the chief of police. Uh, that board would become a part of the city's regular boards and commissions uh, subject to the Brown Act and all of that. Uh, council did, um, request a couple changes. One was adding a requirement uh, to add implicit bias training that has been added to uh, the ordinance just as requested. So these were some minor language changes. Additionally, there was a confusing sentence that was removed uh, that spoke to uh, appointments to the Citizens Advisory Board 
not being made on the basis of constituency or representation of any particular group. And we made sure that we uh, continue the language that was included that spoke to um, the board having a balanced membership representing a cross section of the community and the diversity of the board uh, closely mirroring uh, the diversity of the Eureka community to the extent feasible. Uh, so it would be uh, our recommendation, my recommendation as well, uh, that we waive reading, read by title and adopt the bill. And if you have any questions, I am available. Does anybody have questions for the chief? Looks like we're saved for questions. Uh, do we have any comments from the public? No request to speak tonight, Mayor. Thank you very much. Then I will bring it back to Council for comments or motion. Council Member Bergell. Thank you. I wanted to thank you for um, adding that implicit bias and to just note that that's going to be something that I hope is going to change across the board with all of our committees now, which I think will be really important for our community. So thank you. And with that, I know that there's lots of comments and questions, but I'll just make the motion for fun here. Wave reading, read by title only, and adopt bill number 988 CS, an ordinance of the city of Eureka, amending Eureka Municipal Code, Title 15, Chapter 150, Sections 150.016 and 150.017 pertaining to efficiency dwelling units. All right. Do I have a second? That was the wrong motion. Oh. Thank you. I'm that, so sorry. It was a different oh motion. Oh my God. I read the, I read the <laughs> municipal <I'm> code. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, thank you. That's what happens. Here it yeah. is. I wasn't reading along with her. I will this time. <laughs> that is so funny. Thank you. So wave reading. I, I got the election on my brain here. Wave reading, read by title only and adopt bill number 986-CS, an ordinance of the city of Eureka, adding citizens advisory board to title three or one, two, three, chapter 33, sections 200, 201, 202, 203, 204, 205, 206. And 207. That one oh. sounded right. I'll second that. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Messner. Uh, Councilmember Castellano, I saw you had your hand up before, so discussion time. Just, just briefly, I, I appreciate the changes we talked about last meeting being included, and I'm really excited for this. So thank you, Chief Watson, for all of your efforts towards this. We do really, we do. I really appreciate it as well. Thank you very much. Okay, Council, uh, we get a roll call vote now. Councilmember Castellano? Aye. Councilmember Mesner? Aye. Councilmember Arroyo? Aye. Councilmember Allison? Yes. Councilmember Bergell? Aye. Unanimous yes vote, motion carries. <laughs> All right. Now we get to move on to our reports and action items. And this time we get to hear from Assistant City Manager Powell, who is going to talk to us about the Redwood Empire Municipal Insurance Fund merger. Yes, Mayor and Council, this is a very exciting topic of uh, moving our insurance. Um, and so I know you'll want to hear all of the details, but uh, as you know, the city has been a member of Redwood Empire Municipal Insurance Fund since 1991. Uh, we have been pretty much the largest city um, with employees uh, in that 15 member pool. However, Rohnert Park has overtaken us, I think. They have always been larger in population and they do have more employees than we do now that we no longer have the fire department actually under the city of Eureka. Uh, so uh, Remif about two years ago um, was approached by PARSAC, which is a larger pool, a larger member JPA. And they asked if we would be interested in, in coming either to PARSAC and joining them, our 15 cities, or uh, creating a new uh, JPA. And it would have around 50 cities in it total. Uh, Remif, we were, we've always been a very small JPA in the insurance world. And pooling is a little higher risk for a small JPA. So we were very interested. Uh, currently, um, the city of Eureka itself, our, we spend about two and a half million dollars for workers' comp and liability insurance for the city of Eureka. 
And with property insurance going up and liability, that's only going to um, increase. And so by joining a larger pool and spreading that risk and, and being able to obtain more affordable uh, coverage, we were very interested. So the executive board of REMIF, of which I am a member, the city, each city sends a delegate. So there's a 15 member board. And then we have an executive board of five members and I represent Northern, um, the North Coast region for the cities of Arcata, Fortuna, Fort Bragg, Willits and Eureka. And um, so we've been meeting about two years with PARSAC and uh, we are now to the point where we are asking each city to sign uh, the JPA agreements that are necessary to form this new pool. Parsac, the largest city that Parsac has is Rancho Cucamonga, which is about 200,000 in population. And uh, so it will definitely put the city of Eureka as more of a mid-sized city we will be able to, uh, we will also um, be able to represent the city of Eureka on the board. It will be a, a larger uh, board, but it will also have an executive board, which will do most of the operations. And uh, Rima cities are guaranteed a certain number of seats on that executive board. Uh, locally, the cities of Trinidad and Ferndale and Blue Lake are part of PARSAC. And then Arcata, Fortuna, and Eureka are REMIF. So we'll, we, we will be all together under one JPA. And the benefit of that is the requirements, insurance requirements that the cities have. Sorry, it's a little hard with this mask on. Um, so the insurance requirements that the cities have will all be identical. So that will actually help with contractors and residents who have to meet those city insurance requirements. We won't have a lot of um, disagreement. Uh, those requirements are set forth by the JPA and uh, one city won't have lesser requirements than the other. Uh, so with that, um, if you have any questions, I'm available, but we're looking for support for the JPA. You may have questions. I don't see any. Do we have a line of callers waiting to talk about this issue? No, no, Mayor, we did not. So surprised. Um, in that case, I'll bring it back for comments or a motion. Councilmember Royal. Thank you so much for all your work on this. And I know it's um not the jazziest topic, but um, I know that we really benefit from having good insurance and from pooling the risk with other communities. Um, and so thank you so much for your work on this. Thank you. Council Member Messner. Um, I'll adopt the California Intergovernmental Risk Authority, CIRA, JPA and bylaws and adopt the amended Redwood Empire Municipal Insurance Fund, REMIF, JPA, and bylaws. Is that all we need to say? That is. <laughs> okay. And thank you so much for your work on this, Pam, and um, everything that REMIF is doing to ensure that um, our insurance is, is well, that our people are well taken care of with their insurance. Oh, sorry. <laughs> And Natalie, uh, Councilmember Arroyo seconded. Do we have any more discussion on this? I also want to say, uh, I can't remember what the exact quote was, but it was something about the things we talk about are adversely proportionate to how important they are. So the things that are the least sexy are usually the things that we don't talk about a lot, but they have a huge impact. So again, like everybody else, um, thank you for doing that hard laborious work and sharing it with us. Any other discussion on this? All right, with that, we'll have a roll call vote. All right, <clears throat> Council Member Castellano. Aye. Council Member Messner. Aye. Council Member Arroyo. Aye. Council Member Allison. Aye. Council Member Bergell. Aye. Unanimous yes vote, motion carries. All right. 
Now we get to move on to our report, our city manager report. And today it looks like uh, city manager Slattery, would you like to invite the folks that you are giving your time to, to, to do their report? Yes, thank you, Mayor Seaman, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, tonight, we're going to give an update on the Clark Plaza, um, kind of an update on the firefighter memorial, as well as some other projects economic development is working on. So with that, I will hand it over to economic development manager Asbury, as well as Cap Humble Bay Fire, Captain Terry, and also, from what I understand, the uh, water rescue coordinator for Humble Bay Fire. So. Take it away, you guys. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, good evening, Mayor and Council. And I'm going to give you a brief update on Clark Plaza. We have a couple different projects coming together that includes the Clark Plaza Community Food Court, the Humboldt Bay Fire Memorial, and some beautification and landscape changes. Back in September, I presented to you our Eureka Cares Restaurant, Bar, and Retailer Support Program. And part of that program is an outdoor eating area at Clark Plaza so that citizens can get takeout from surrounding restaurants and then have a pleasant place to go and eat. We've ordered the tables and signage and we're partnering with the visitor center to put the tables out and in. But since we were at it, we thought we should also partner with Humboldt Bay Fire on their memorial installation to really increase the positive activity in the area. Uh, David Terry from Humboldt Bay Fire is joining me tonight. David, do you wanna give um, council an update on the memorial and your fundraising efforts? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so, hello everyone. Uh, it's nice to see everyone again. I haven't seen a lot of you in a while. So, uh, real quickly, uh, a little over a year ago, we came to you looking to install a fallen firefighters memorial to honor uh, our six fallen firefighters that we've had through the history of the Eureka Fire Department, now Humboldt Bay Fire. Um, in that time, we have managed to raise almost all of our uh, fundraising goal, uh, which we initially had sent out at $40,000 um, through various donations and uh, help through the community. We've managed to just about get where we need to be. Uh, we've already contracted with the artist who's going to be doing the bronze memorial. Uh, it is currently down in the Bay Area at the foundry being cast right now. Uh, we're hoping to have that back sometime in November. Uh, we've also contracted with a stonemason who is in the process right now of uh, cutting the pedestal that the uh, bronze statue will sit on, as well as the benches that are going to go around the memorial. And he's also going to be uh, redoing the, uh, the base, the foundation <clears throat> in the Clark Plaza where the memorial will sit. Um, with that, uh, speaking with Swan uh, and Christine Tyson, we've been working on uh, moving forward with the landscaping part of the project. Um, and I'll let Swan speak about that a little bit more here in a few minutes. Uh, but as of right now, um, with everything moving forward, we're hoping to have everything completed and have a dedication ceremony sometime uh, late spring, early summer uh, for the official unveiling. But we're hoping to have the work done long before then. Thank you. So while working on implementing the community food court and memorial, uh, we felt we really needed to address some of the landscape issues and do everything we can to beautify and activate the area. Um, first of all, there's a tree that affects the brickwork that's being laid for the memorial and has affected the irrigation, the concrete planter and sidewalk. Second, the whole area looks a little bit rough and unmaintained. And then third, from a septed perspective, it's not the most welcoming area. The brush is kind of high and it's hard to see what's going on inside. Visibility is important to enhance feelings of comfort and security. 
I reached out to EPD, and since the beginning of the year, we've had 60 incidents at Clark Plaza. So we really want to turn Clark Plaza into a COVID-safe, vibrant, family-friendly destination. Uh, we had GHD provide us with a conceptual planting plan. It does involve removing the existing landscape, but then planting a combination of ground covers, grasses, and seven trees, most of which are native and should do well in that area with minimal maintenance. Uh, the plan going forward is to remove the existing landscaping, grade the area, have the memorial installed, then plant the new landscaping, have the area power washed, and then move forward with the outdoor community food court. So that's it for my presentation tonight. We are looking forward to making this project happen quickly. We would love for you guys to um, support and promote the space after we finish the improvements, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, it looks like Council Member Messner has something to say. Oh, she's muted though. Oh, sorry. I just had a question in those, um, there are like four different, maybe stones. Are those stones? What's the dark, the four things that are dark around the edges? It looks like there's like um, seating areas, but then what are the four pieces? Yeah, so I can answer that. Um, okay. So the the four stones and Swan, I don't know if maybe you can that great. Um, the the four stones that you see are going to be the supports uh, for the benches, and they're actually okay. going to be hewn out of granite. And the symbolism there oh. is three benches with the four seating, which is the three four three, which is the number of firefighters that were killed on nine eleven, which has become synonymous with all firefighter memorials and um, firefighter recognition. Great. Well, that really helps, actually. Thank you for for clearing that up. But also, yeah. that's that's really important, and I think it'd be valuable for people to know that too. So, thank you. Yep, definitely. Right on. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? Councilmember Royo, and then Castellano. I know there's a lot of um, uh, perhaps mixed feelings about the trees at Clark Plaza. There are, um, there's some passion for them amongst people who frequent Old Town um, or live in Old Town who've reached out to council. And so I was wondering about the possibility of keeping the tree that's furthest away from the memorial and replanting the area around it. I realize it is creating some maintenance challenges, but is there the possibility of, um, you know, kind of splitting it down the middle and making the change to the area immediately adjacent to the memorial um, while not impacting that other very large and stately tree that has, um, yeah, has been the cause of some, some community concern. Yeah, I think from here, staff will be meeting with Humboldt Bay Fire and the park crew to really talk about um, the trees. I, I will say that tree does impact the irrigation and so planting new plantings with irrigation that has issues is, is something to keep in mind, but it's something that we can keep working on. Council Member Castellano. I had um, almost the exact same comment <laughs> that I was going to uh, propose to council. And earlier today, I, I spent some time talking with um, some citizens and with Captain Terry. And um, I, I do think that there are many people who are attached to those trees. And, and I think if, if possible, it would be um, appreciated to keep the one on the, more on the corner there. Um, you know, we don't have very many trees that big in Old Town. So I think that that tree is, is fondly, um, yeah, it renders fond feelings in the community. Council Member Bergell. I too have been, <clears throat> I too have been reached out to about these trees, and I um, 
I echo what I've heard here today. If there is a way that we can salvage at least one tree, that would be that would be really helpful. Those trees, do you know the age of those trees, Swan? I don't know the age of the trees. It just, they are more mature and, um, you know, we don't have a lot of mature trees down there. So yeah, I would love for you to consider what's been brought forward. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I just have a, oh, okay, <laughs> Councilmember Royal. Um, while I do love the idea of preserving one of the trees, the one that's the bigger and further away from the memorial, um, that, you know, if, if at all possible, I do really like the planting plan, including um, native plants. And um, I think that's wonderful to include. And I'm grateful that, um, that that has been developed. So thank you for your hard work on that. And the, the memorial looks beautiful. Um, I, I had only seen um, the sculptural element of it as proposed and I didn't, um, maybe I just didn't remember, but <laughs> the benches look really beautiful um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing it there. So thank you for continuing your hard work on this. Thank you. And my question was also for uh, Fire Captain Terry. You said you're very close to raising all of your funds. How far away are you? Uh, we just had a recent fundraiser the other night with Mod Pizza, and I don't have those numbers back yet, uh, so I can't give you an exact number, um, but I, I believe we're only a couple of thousand dollars away from, from hitting our mark, so. Oh, nice. nice. I, um, today when I heard you were the water rescue coordinator, I'll remind you that firemen went and saved me from drowning. I was dead for a while, so. I do remember um, that, yes. Very happy that you guys are gonna have your um, your sculpture soon and we'll see what we can do to raise that last bit that you need. Thank you. Council member uh, Castellano. Is there a, a link to your fundraiser or anything like that that council could share to help kind of facilitate the success? Yeah, absolutely. We have a, a, a GoFundMe page and I would be more than happy to email that to you. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, but if anybody wants to, you can just search. Uh, it would be Fallen Firefighters Memorial, Eureka, California. All right, Councilmember Brigel. Do you have a link on your social media pages on Facebook or Instagram? Yes, we do have a Facebook page and there is a link on that to, uh, that will take you to the GoFundMe page as well. And if people want to make donations the old fashioned way, they're always welcome to stop by uh, headquarters station there at 533 C Street. And they're more than welcome to bring in a do donation there as well. So is the social media page, is it Humboldt Bay Fire or does it have its own separate page? No, it's its own separate page. It's uh, Fallen Firefighters Memorial, Eureka, California. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. And I'm excited to see things happening at Clark Plaza as well. Mm -hmm. Use a little sprucing up. So thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Castellano. Sorry, <laughs> one more thing. Um, some of the constituents that contacted me were just concerned about the, the trees, the new trees that were planted. Uh, if we could just make sure we got bigger trees um, to start off with that might um, kind of fare the access from the public um, easier. So, you know, if we have a choice between, I don't know, 15 gallon and 30 gallon or whatever size they come in, go for the, go for the bigger trees, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Very nice. Do we have any other comments for um, either, Economic Development Manager Asbury or Captain uh, Fire Captain Terry. Any others? All right. Thank you so much for your presentation. And um, City Manager Slattery, do you have anything else you would like to share tonight? I just want to kind of echo the sentiments of Mayor Seaman as well as the other council members. The partnership with Humble Bay Fire has been outstanding working with them. 
spaghetti feed and the other stuff that we've done to make this come to fruition is going to be a huge game changer for Clark Plaza. Um, as all the business owners uh, can tell you down there, and obviously EPB, there's been some um, issues with Clark Plaza, and it's a it's unfortunate. And we're hoping, and I'm very happy that um, Economic Development Manager Swan has taken this under her wing and um, is looking for improvements to increase the appropriate uses there and, and utilize the space as it should be. And I think the combination of these two things are going to make a huge difference down there. So thank you both, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. And with that, we will go to our uh, council reports and I will start the top left hand corner of my uh, thing, which is council member Castellano. Let's see, um, been, you know, just busy with the typical <laughs> board meetings and commissions. Um, I am working with the ink people on a uh, lantern procession, a socially distanced appropriate lantern proce procession to take place uh, around Old Town near solstice time. So look for information about that coming out. Um, and thankful to the county for, I, they have already approved my, uh, my plan for that event. So it's great working with them and really thinking about the you know, COVID precautions that will make events like that successful. Um, continuing to attend some kind of separate meetings on housing. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up to council that I did uh, talk with Mayor Seaman about was um, looking at the fireworks, our fireworks ordinance. Um, I'm, I've continued to receive um, inquiries from constituents with concerns about fireworks. And so I'm just wondering if other council members would support uh, bringing that forward. Um, and so this is just a consensus. We can't talk about it. So who is in favor of bringing it to the to a later agenda? Is that a, a yes, Austin? Yeah. Okay. Um, and Natalie and Kim. And Heidi. Okay, it looks like we're good. Council or uh, City Manager Slattery. Council Member Castellano, can you clarify what you want brought forward? Um, I think it would be. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, specifically looking at um, what the city can do, and I, you know, I'm not myself familiar enough with the fireworks ordinances at this time. But what could the city do to um, address uh, illegal fireworks activity in the neighborhoods um, and, and how like how do our ordinances already address that and how could we potentially uh, introduce ways of uh, tightening up our ordinances or refining our ordinances to discourage um, illegal fireworks activity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then I'm going to go down to Council Member Messner. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to reaffirm what Mayor Seaman said earlier in her mayor's comments that um, just no matter the results of this election, the greatest determinant of our strength and resiliency and health as a city is just determined by how we treat one another in our community. And I know that in times of stress, it's it can be really challenging and Often when we think we're at the end of something, we're actually at the beginning of something else. And so um, just to keep in mind that during this time um, that we really just encouraging one another and remembering that every person is worthwhile and has value. And so if we can value one another and be people who are kind and patient um, and take joy in one another and the ability to encourage one another to um, be the the unique person that we that they are in our community that we will see um, we will get we will actually become healthier and re more resilient as a city that it's really important because that's that matters more um, no matter what ends up happening in regard to any elections so I just wanted to encourage people that, you know, some, a sense of hope comes from being 
caring and loving toward one another and encouraging one another. So I appreciate Mayor Seaman, your words at the beginning um, in regards to Mr. Rogers and he was a great encouragement of how we treat one another. And so hopefully we will take those words um, that he gave us in being people who truly value one another. And, um, and that will make us stronger. Thank you. Council Member Burgell. A meeting is a challenge. <laughs> well, um, I've just been doing my regular meetings. I'm back at work. And I did get the opportunity, oh my gosh, to go to Boo at the Zoo this year. Um, and I got to dress up, which I love to do, as many of you know. And so it was so wonderful to see families out having a great time together, engaging, the kids running around in their little outfits. Everybody was masked, everybody got a treat bag. Um, the only real downside to it, I was telling um, city manager, Slattery was that usually there's a whole group of kids that don't always get to go to the zoo that go on Halloween. And um, even though it's a paid day, oftentimes their parents splurge to, to bring them up to the zoo. So that was kind of, um, you know, kind of sad a little bit, but for the most part, I loved it. It was so great to see. I mean, there were some families, you guys, that were just, they had a family with Ed, Edward Scissor, Scissorhands family and just, I mean, it was just fabulous and um, hopefully they'll get some pictures up. And then I too, I just wanna echo, be kind anyway. <laughs> and it's really not that hard to be kind. Um, and I know for me, when I can't, I just really try and keep my mouth shut. So thank you for the, the words earlier from both of you. I really appreciate that because that's how we get through stuff is community and working together, not divisiveness and calling people names. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Arroyo. Great. Um, well, I spent the day before Halloween, um, not the whole day, but the evening before Halloween at Coast Guard Housing, um, handing out candy um, in a safe and socially distanced fashion outside and watching a costume parade and got to judge the costumes. Um, for kids who live in Coast Guard housing. So it was open only to Coast Guard members. I know normally that's a big trick-or-treating location for the community, but this year that was um, off the table. And instead it was Coast Guard families only. Um, and it was really fun and really made me appreciate how much um, Coast Guard families are part of the Eureka community. Um, even though housing is just outside of city limits, um, it is still um, a huge component of the Eureka community here and it was fun to see the kids and very tough to judge the costumes. Um, I realized I don't really like judging children's costumes. I'm like, they're all great and perfect. <laughs> so um, so that was rough, but I, I soldiered on. Um, and then uh, in more serious city business, um, the Humboldt Transit Authority is um, looking pretty seriously at hydrogen fueling stations and hydrogen buses since um, diesel buses will not be something that we can buy um, within the next, within the coming years, we won't be able to buy diesel or gasoline powered buses. They'll need to be electric or, um, or hydrogen fuel. And so the electric bus has buses have been great. Um, there is some electric vehicle charging, but the range is still limited. And so for such a large vehicle, um, there are some challenges with the charging time and the range um, and having the power needed to get around our big rural county. So um, HDA is looking at hydrogen fueling um, pretty seriously. Um, and that is something that, you know, we may have have as a community a need to invest in um, in the not so distant future. So I bring it up just because it's sort of food for thought about what happens with big fleets. Um, you know, I don't know if that's a possibility way down the line for um, for city 
apparatus as well, or what you know the technology is going to look like. But um, it's one consideration for transit and maybe for other um, other types of vehicles in the future. So some information to come about how that will impact um, infrastructure that HGA has in Eureka, but um, I believe that's the only update that I had. And it, you know, honestly, we don't know that much about how it will play out yet. Um, but that is all I can think of. So I will I will leave it there. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Allison. Hey, um, just want to thank everyone who went out and voted today. It's the most important way to showcase your voice on issues and to remind people the history of politics and democracy was originally created to reduce warfare with one another. So we have to remind ourselves to be civil um, in unprecedented times and to learn to agree to disagree um, on a lot of issues and that we are neighbors. We have to learn to get along and I hope we can with no matter what happens in the future here. And um, I did want to add for an agenda item for the upcoming meeting. Uh, so I wanted to agendize for discussion at the next council meeting, the consideration of a full-time contract for interim city manager, Miles Slattery. I personally think Miles has displayed a fantastic job and duty to the city. And I don't think we can find a better person currently. I think it is important that we act sooner than later, as I don't think it's fair to keep people in interim roles for too long who want the full-time job. So I'd really be interested in discussing this at the next city council meeting. So do we have, can we take a vote on who would like to see this on the next council meeting? We don't really vote on this, right? It's well, just you have to, we have to, just who would like to have, to see if we can have a majority. That's I would I was be willing to hear about. Yes. I would be willing to talk about it. Yeah. Okay, so we, we want to put uh, that on the agenda for the next meeting. Because it's personnel, would it, I'm sorry to interrupt, but would it have sorry. to be closed session or would it be an open session kind of thing? That was my question as well. That yeah, that was my question too. <laughs> um, I don't see where's Bob. It seems uh, like Bob is having some technical yeah, issues. Yes, um, we could we could agendize it for, for discussion. Oh. oh, is Bob back? No, I for me you you just went out. I'm sorry. Maybe not be the opposite. I didn't hear you. Me too. Oh, yeah. can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, you can do it for either or um, or for both. You can have a discussion in closed session, uh, and then it would you would you wouldn't you could I would recommend that you put it in closed session for discussion, and then you can from that session put a contract or a contract in open session um, at the next meeting. It's, it's up to you, honestly. So closed session at the upcoming meeting and then open session the meeting after, or and then the uh, regular meeting the meeting after? Uh, that would be, yeah, the 17th and then December 1st. Okay. Good. All right. Well, it okay. looks like we have enough people who are willing to talk about it because we have four out of five. So um, then it'll, then we'll do that on the closed session for the next meeting. And anything else to report? All righty. Then in that case, we will adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>